And Hi everyone. Now. Yeah, we're here for Science Sunday. And although it's not Sunday, um, we're running these series of Hangouts where we feature different scientists from our si awesome science community here on Google+. And today we have um, Dr. Tommy Leung here to talk about the body snatchers and all about parasitology. Um, so that's Tommy, if you haven't guessed already. Hello. And helping me host today is Scott, who helped us last time with Erin and the Monkey Business Hangout. Hi, everybody. And How are you doing? Um, let's kick things off with asking Tommy to introduce himself, explain what his work is, so everyone knows what we do. Well, what do uh, do? my yep, sure. Uh, so my name is uh, Tommy Lung. Uh, you can see down there, and I basically work on parasites. Uh, I'm interested in just how parasites live out their life and their life cycle, how they survive in the host, how they get from one host to another. And I do. I approach parasitology um, from the kind of approach of evolutionary biology. So I treat them pretty much like any other animals. So other people might observe the behavior of birds, notice the the breeding pattern of fish and things like that. I pretty much treat parasites the same way, but also keeping in mind that parasites live in a very different environment to most animals and. You know, they have very slow quirks that makes them, to me anyway, more interesting than, say, fish or birds, even though they do live in fish and birds. Yeah, because it's a very specific niche that they have to adapt to. And it's it not is. the same. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, superficially, it seems like a specific niche. But then when you think about it, uh, all the habitats available on this planet, uh, living bodies are available habitats. Mm -hmm. And for, you know, it's just that you require very specific adaptation to live in those particular habitats because uh, unlike most other habitats you might live in, let's say in a lake or desert, um, the, the habitat that you'll be living in as a parasite is actually out to get you. So you can kill, like you could be killed by the place that you live in. So whereas most people, when they think of, say, a very extreme inhospitable environment, they think of, say, in the middle of the Sahara Desert, where if you're not prepared either evolutionarily or if you were planning and you weren't prepared properly, you could die of, say, dehydration or exposure. But when you die in the middle of the Sahara Desert, you didn't die because the desert is out to kill you. Whereas when you're a parasite, uh, when you live inside a, but the body of a host, the host is out to get you. It is personal. It is yeah. trying to get rid of you. So that also brings up another kind of uh, misconception people have about parasites, which is which you could tell from the way that people use parasite, the word parasite in their languages. So they talk about when they talk about parasite, they sometimes compare them to like, oh, you know, these people, they're parasite, they're leeching off the system, they're lazy, <laughs> no good people, you know. Uh, and I disagree that on two fronts. First of all, it's very dehumanizing language that I don't like hear people using. But the other thing is that it's actually technically incorrect because far from being a lazy way of life, uh, parasitism is actually a very <laughs> difficult way of life because um, your body has your immune system. Uh, other animals such as insects and crustaceans, they have the equivalent of the immune system which mechanistically functions very differently from how our immune system works but it still performs the same function which is to kill any intruder that gets into its body. Uh, plants, they have their own immune system of sorts to fight off various infections from bacteria, from nematode worms. Even some bacteria have a kind of adaptive immune system. So in certain bacteria, they have a system that I don't have time to go into detail here, but it's called, uh, the acronym is CRISPR. And what it does is that it recognizes strands of RNA from intruding viruses, and they're able to grab that strand of RNA destroy the virus and add it to a library. And when you look at the CRISPR gene in certain bacteria, you can actually trace back the history of all the viruses it has ever been exposed to because it has a library of all the antagonizing virus that it always have to fight off. So the fact that everything from bacteria to human beings have some kind of an immune system for fighting off invaders tells us two things. First of all, uh, parasitism is a ubiquitous way of life. Uh, it 
we even though for, uh, parasites don't leave fossil, leave fossils in the fossil record, we can pretty much infer from the patterns that we see from modern life that pretty much as soon as there is life, there are parasites to live on those lives that aren't parasitic. In fact, I think there should be a t-shirt going around that says, you are either infected or infecting. <laughs> so, welcome to planet Earth. The second thing that it tells us is that because everything as a parasite that you could possibly infect from plants to animals to single cell organisms have some way of defending themselves against you, it tells you that parasitism is in fact an extremely difficult way of life and parasites have very sophisticated adaptations for getting through the host and making a living while surviving in the host. Cool. So actually calling someone a useless parasite is a compliment. <laughs> Quite possibly. I, I really, in I think the current way that people use that language, yeah. I wouldn't take that so readily. I'd be like, yeah. well actually, you should be calling <laughs> them something else. I don't know what, but it's certainly not parasites. Right. Well, that, I think that's a, a great way to introduce what we'll be talking about today and um, just going into detail about what's going on. So as many of you know, this is the month of December here on Google Plus where uh, the Google Science Fair has teamed up with this amazing group called Girl Starch, which is a group out of Austin, Texas, which is focused on bringing um, girls K-12 through and bringing them to the STEM fields, which stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. So here we have Tommy today to bring us into the life of a paras let's see, parasitologist, is that correct? Yep, parasitologist. Parasitologist. And go and see what the, the interesting life of Tommy is, but also the, the really interesting lives of these either microscopic or even macroscopic. We actually are able to see these with our, with our eyes. So I'll be checking the comments here, fielding any questions to Tommy. So if you have sure. any questions, put them on to YouTube, onto the Google Plus event page. Also, any of the shares that have gone out through Google Plus. And if you're on Twitter using the hashtag December, I'll be able to check those as well and field your questions and comments for Tommy. So one thing I'd like to ask Tommy to explain is parasitism is a very um, because there's symbiotic relationships. Can you explain the difference between parasitism, symbiosism? Because a lot of times you have symbiotic relationships where two organisms help each other, and one is parasitizing the enemy of the other. So sure. you're my friend because you're my enemy's enemy. Yep. And it's, so can you explain um, a few examples like that? Yeah, I, I wrote a little review paper that I might, uh, I'll put the link up to on the events page after the Hangout, uh, okay. where I discuss the, the continuum between mutualists and parasites. And it's really a gray line. Uh, we decide to draw the line somewhere, okay, well, this is a mutualist and this is a parasite. But in fact, when you look at how it actually occurs in the natural world, you'll find that sometimes the line isn't so clear cut. So, for example, some of the parasites I've worked with, with, which are parasitic flukes, there are little worms that are no more than a centimeter long, and they live inside the guts of either birds, mammals, a lot of vertebrate animals, and they live there, and they don't really cause any pathology unless there's hundreds or thousands of them. So, at that point, you go, well, it's, is it really a parasite? Because parasites are supposed to be harmful to the host, or at least in some definition. Uh, in other definition, then sure, you can say it's a parasite because it is taking something, something away from the host, but then it's not really giving anything back. But just to complicate that story a little bit more, uh, I'm going to talk about a species of parasitic worm which is found on the coral reef. And this particular parasitic worm is a parasitic fluke. And as a part of its life cycle, it infects coral polyps. And when it infects coral polyps, it makes them swell up and you know turn bright orange. And so it's this big lump. And then you have coral fish that comes along, uh, butterfly fish, and eats the polyps. And then they get infected with the worm, except that the worm isn't very good at infecting the fish. And so most of them just get passed out. And also uh, the worms that are still alive in, inside the fish, it doesn't really cause the fish any harm. But from the fish's perspective, it's actually helpful to have those worms because coral polyps that aren't infected with the worm, they are very small 
and they retract very quickly. So as soon as the fish comes along, it retracts back, back into the exoskeleton, uh, well, back into the calcium skeleton, whereas the coral polyps that are infected with this worm, they're big, they're swollen, so it's like the difference between picking like, you know, a tiny salad versus like a huge burger. And seeing how the fish isn't really harmed by having the worm inside its gut, you can almost say that this parasite is actually mutualist because it's helping the fish get more food. So it's a really, you know, it's a it's really blurry kind of line. So for example, um, some mycorrhizal fungi that lives on the roots of plants, most complex plant like trees, flowers, all the plants around us, uh, they have mycorrhizal fungi that are attached to their roots and these fungi help them collect nutrients except that under certain circumstances some fungi can actually turn parasitic so for a while they could be helping the plant but under other climatic or environmental conditions they go well it's more beneficial for us now to be leaching off the plant so they switch from being beneficial to being harmful so it's a really kind of blurry line sometimes now, have, have you noticed in there that maybe they'll cultivate to make the the host healthier to actually provide more food later on? It's it's kind of um, it really depends on circumstance. So that brings up the whole um, one of the line of parasitology or paras uh, evolutionary study in parasites is looking at the evolution of virulence. So how much. Uh, how harmful should a parasite be? And basically, the if you sum sum it up in one line, it would be a parasite or a symbiont would be as exploitative to the host as it could get away with. Hence, why when you have high population density, where it's easy for parasite to transmit from one host to another, they just go. Meh. If we kill this host, we can just jump onto another one. So they evolve to be more harmful. And in fact, it's beneficial for them to be harmful because the more prudent parasites that hold back, they get outcompeted by the more virulent one. Whereas if you have, say, a sparse population that are spread out more, that actually selects for parasites that are less harmful because those that kill their host very quickly, they will not get the opportunity to pass on to another host before they kill it. So it's this constant constantly fluctuating situation and also with some parasites especially with parasitic flukes that I worked with they go through a complex life cycle where they infect different hosts at different stages of their life and depending on what purpose they use the host for they can be either extremely harmful or they're barely noticeable. Now do you have any images of these flukes? Yes I have an image uh, prepared right here which is of a um, it's an ecto, uh, well, it's, it's a bladder worm. It's a bladder fluke from a frog. And so this is how it looks like on the right. You see that's the, the head of the worm. Uh, and on the posterior end, you have the so-called haptor. And you see these little suckers, which clamps onto the, the inner surface of the, the bladder of the frog. And this, this particular worm belongs to a flatworm family called the polystomatids. It's in a class called the monogenians, and monogenians are known to be mostly parasites of fish. So they live on fish skin or fish gills, except that this particular family has evolved to live in a very unusual niche for this group, which is in the bladder of frogs and toads. Uh, the other um, habitat that this particular family of worms are found in are also in the bladders of turtles. And there is one peculiar species that live underneath the eyelid of hippopotamus. So you have, so that, that sets up an interesting question. It's like, why is it that the worms from this family are found in these particular groups of hosts and so far it seems that they have a co-evolutionary relationship with amphibians so ancestrally they might have lived on amphibian and this is supported by evidence that this family of worms are also found in lungfish so they might have started out just living in amphibians and because turtles share the same habitat as amphibians also being semi-aquatic they have also uh, colonized turtles uh, through a host jumping event and it just so happens that 
hippopotamus uh, also are found in same habitat, so they somehow jump onto hippopotamus. But this is um, just what we could have infer very relatively speculatively from molecular evidence, but also the phylogeny of the host, because parasites being what they are, they're not very good at living, leaving any uh, fossil record. So as a result, um, we are limited to what we can find. But what it does tell us is this kind of really long history of coevolution between the host and the parasites, that the, some parasites are so-called heirloom parasites. Uh, that's actually a technical term that I've seen used in papers uh, that are parasites that are inherited from the ancestral host. So that is uh, some of the example that the kind of the kind of research that you can do and people do do uh, looking at parasites and far from being specialized I in fact see the study of parasitism as something that is very broad because you can ask all kinds of questions about them you can study their evolutionary history or you can study how they interact with their hosts how they get on with their day-to-day -day lives that is crazy I, I mean, I love the, the term host jumping. It, it sounds like they're just extremists out there just doing, <laughs> giving an adrenaline ride. But, yeah. it, I mean, it definitely makes sense that they do need yeah. to find a better host. Yeah. I, I do definitely love that term, host jumping. Yeah. Well, um, during, yeah. During Aaron's hangout, we mentioned, like, just very briefly about, uh, you know, monkey pathogens, monkey parasites. Uh, one of the papers that I linked to on the event page, which I might just link to again here, uh, there was a group of researchers that looked at the probability of how many host jump event has occurred between non-human primates and human beings. And so they looked at how often, say, lice or worms or viruses or bacteria, how often they've jumped across, jumped species or even jumped genus. And they found that viruses are better at host jumping than others, maybe because they are um, relatively simple comparing with, say, more complex multicellular parasites like, you know, lice or worms. And so it's easier for them to jump from one host to another comparing with these other parasites, which often are very, very specialized just on that one species of host and no, nothing else. Well, and I guess that makes sense to me. I'm not a biologist at all. But when I when we're talking about life in the universe with astronomy, what, what always comes up is extremophiles. And mm -hmm. they're typically very, very simple organisms, yet yep. they're able to thrive in very extreme circumstances. Yep. So the more complex um, any sort of, of anything is, whether we're talking about machinery or we're talking about biology, mm -hmm. the more complex it is, the more variables have to go into place to make sure it can actually yes. thrive there. So that, That's right. that, that does at least make sense to me in my, my astronomy brain. <laughs> sure. I mean, this is kind of like a, almost a fundamental phenomena that, you know, the more complex something is, you have to add in more variability. And also as a result of that, it might also limit your option because of evolutionary legacy. Evolution can't go backward. It can only make do what, with what it has. So it can't just completely go, black, go back to the drawing board to go, okay, let's start over again. They just go, no, we have to just jury rig this thing for this other thing. And then, yeah. Now, we've, we've got a comment here. I'm actually going you know, to try this new thing here of sharing it on the screen. Sure. Let's see if this pops up here for everyone. Oh, great. Awesome. It works. So um, Michael asks, you know, a question for Tommy. Any thoughts on why the parasite to host body mass ratio is often so large in insects and some other organisms compared to vertebrates? Is it merely a general size um, allometry or something else? I guess, I guess when you have an insect host, uh, you are more limited in the size, like how much space you can occupy within an insect host, whereas with a vertebrate animal, uh, you have more habitats to occupy. So with, let's say, take a human being, for example, as a vertebrate host, you have parasites that can live in the, the eye, you can have parasites that live in gastrointestinal tracts, the circulatory system. There is just a more variable habitat, and because of its more variable habitat, you also have parasites of uh, many different sizes as well. So you can have tapeworms that stretch for meters, or you can have tiny worms that are millimeters long, or you can have bacteria that infects you. So uh, there is some constraint, and I don't think that 
Uh, this is kind of an ongoing development. People still, there are still so many questions relating to how hosts and parasites interact with each other that there is a possibility of, uh, you know, looking at size allometry. And I, I believe there are people looking at the biomass ratio between the host and the parasite as well. So when you look at an infected host, how much of that biomass is actually parasite? Yeah, cause I, I, you know, we were talking actually a little bit before the hangout as far as some of those um, the, those parasite wasps and what they actually do. And you know, yes. if you think about the the actual mass of the host compared to oh, yes. the parasite going in, it, it it literally just starts taking over the entire mm -hmm. being. Oh and yes, you can have you know smaller things like you know, you know, dogs you know, having worms or something like that. Mm -hmm. Something very common that we see that there's treatment all the time for that they have something and it does live off the 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 host itself yeah but there seems to be a huge variety in there so that's really oh yes yeah how that there there's just different uh, variables going to play with that yeah and it also depends on how how the um the parasite use the host so for example in parasitic flukes which i'm most familiar with they uh it, when they infect the the first host in the first ver invertebrate host in the life cycle uh they undergo asexual replicate or asexual multiplication they basically clone themselves and that's where they take up the entire um the the, the viscera mass of the snail so they mostly infect snails and in fact, I might be able to find a picture for you of uh, how, how that looks like because it, it is quite confronting when you see it. Now I'm a little worried. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. just, just, I'm curious be, now. <laughs> just be thankful you're not a snail because it is not. It's, I did wake up thinking myself I wasn't a snail, but now I, I'll reaffirm <laughs> that. <laughs> I'll thank you for sharing that. Uh, screen share. Let's have a look at this. Is that is that visible? Yeah, yeah. it is. Great. Yeah. So that is uh, over on the left. That's the gonads of an infected snail. Snail that's infected with a tree methyl parasite. Over on the right is the gonads of a perfectly healthy and uninfected snail. So you can see the difference. They practically take over the entire gonads of the snail. And wow. the reason that these parasitic flukes uh, do this is that they actually use the snail, they turn the snail into a parasite factory. So these little sausage shaped thing, uh, they stay inside the snail, but the purpose for existence is to produce the next stage in the life cycle, which are these little tadpole like things. And they swim out of the snail to go on to infect the next host in the life cycle. And the infection, uh, as far as we know, they don't go away. It's like that for the rest of the snail's life. And in some freshwater snail, they only live for a few years or even just one year. But in some of the marine snails, they can live for maybe even decades, for 10 years, for 20 years. And there's been marked cap capture recapture studies where people have found that they captured the snail, they found that it was infected with tree methyl, and then they marked it, and then they come back, you know, 10 years later, and they found that it was still shedding the same parasites, which show that it hasn't gotten rid of it. And for parasites like these, it's actually in the interest to keep the host alive for as long as possible, because as long as the host is alive, it will serve the purpose of being a little parasite baby factory, just keep on pumping out these parasite larvae. And in fact, in these particular, uh, there are some evidence that they altered the shell shape of the snail so that they will have more space to occupy. Uh, there is also evidence that they secrete certain hormones that change the growth of the snail, what they eat, and things like that. Uh, these are all questions that are still up in the air at the moment. People don't really know the definitive answer to uh, what they actually do. And it seems to vary from one species to another. And of course, um, it's a very uh, good strategy for parasite to castrate the host because especially invertebrates which have more of their biomass devoted to their gonads because uh, let's say a snail or crab or any other animal they need the gonads to reproduce but they don't need it to stay alive so that let the parasite have almost the whole have the have their cake and eat it too because they can get the most 
uh, possible out of the host without killing it. And exploiting the reproductive tissue is the best way for them to go about it. Thank you for being the source of tonight's nightmare. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that—that that is just a start. With and, and you know, I, I'm not a squeamish person. I've—I've I've worked EMS for seven years. I've seen a sure. lot of things. But thinking about something completely terraforming my gonads for its own yeah. purpose is something that I don't really try yeah. to think about. But I yeah. appreciate. It. But no, this is well, really interesting. <laughs> how that it, it does repurpose it for mm -hmm. it, it already has that purpose just for yeah. a different being. So. If it already has that infrastructure there, why not yeah. use it? That well, makes complete sense to me. Uh, yeah. It's my one, human one, of, one of the best examples of like this kind of uh, re-engineering uh, by parasites is in Trichinella spiralis. So Trichinella spiralis is a little nematode worm that infects the muscle cells of mammals. And this worm can pass on when, say, a carnival comes along and eat the flesh that is infected. And in fact, this is probably one of the first parasites that were ever discovered. And I believe it might have been discovered by Sir Richard Owens. And back then, he was one of the few people to have a microscope. So he was one of the few people to be able to look at these things under the microscope. And he was really into doing autopsies and stuff like that. And there used to be uh, a thing called a sandy diaphragm. So when you cut open a cadaver, your scalpel gets dull because you cut through the diaphragm and then there's all these sandy grains inside the diaphragm. And when he looked under the microscope, he found that they were filled with the, each of these little grains are in fact a little worm curled up inside a muscle cell. So this is called trichinella, this particular worm, trichinella spiralis. In a review paper, I think it was written by uh, Professor Dixon de Palmier, he called it the worm that would be a virus because it does a lot of things that viruses do uh, as far as reprogramming the cell for its purpose goes. So this little worm, when it digs inside the muscle cell, the muscle cell from the outside looks like it just becomes calcified, just becomes a calcified lump. But in fact, what the worm is doing is that it gets in and then it just do DIY on the interior of the cell. It takes over the genetic machinery of the cell, it renovates the whole place, and it turns it into what's known as a nurse cell. And also sends out signals that um, are very similar to kind of signals that are sent out by cancer cell. It induces angiogenesis. It induces blood vessels to grow around the cell. And the interior of the cell becomes almost a womb like the worm. So it alters the muscle cell into becoming almost this placenta-like thing that houses the worm and brings in nutrients from the body. And I mean, that's crazy. <laughs> that's amazing. That, but It is amazing. That's, yeah, yeah. But that's, that's something just, you've never really, th when I think parasites, yeah. in, my, in my ever, even when I was working in medicine, when I think parasites, I don't think something that complex. I think of a yeah. lamprey or something like that, just, just attached yeah. to a fish literally sucking the soul yeah. out of his host but nothing this advanced and, and yeah. it's it's really interesting to think about you know the bioengineering going on and mm -hmm. completely just repurposing something that's there oh, yeah. and then i love diy yeah. it's like you're watching you know microscopic uh, pbs and you know this yeah. old host and they're able to re <laughs> redo everything yeah they just come in and go okay well we need to refit this because i need to bring some nutrients through you know the cell <laughs> this is a muscle cell i can't I can't deal with this. I gotta repurpose. I gotta knock some walls out. Right. So this is this is what uh, parasites do. But like trichinella is just one of literally thousands of examples of parasites, and they all have their own different way of repurposing the host for their own use. So it's parasites are the I, I consider them as being the most sophisticated and the most advanced organism on this planet because they have to explore the resource which is uh, constantly fighting against them and have their own purpose. So they have to repurpose the host at the same time fighting off the host attempt to kill it as well. Right. Now I'm going to ask a taboo question though, but that could actually put humans in that category too to some extent. I mean, there are many different things that we do repurpose that have its own purpose, and much to the detriment of that other species. You know, I, well, as someone that works with space, and that we have yeah. a common thing that we talk about: the the universe is trying to kill you. 
It, you know, we, we have this yeah. amazing planet that we live on that we're protected by our magnetic sphere. We have this atmosphere we're allowed to breathe, and it's, we're really protected. But once you leave that, yeah. everything out there will kill you. Yeah. And so we are on this host planet, and we are utilizing its resources. At least yeah. that's how, when I, I talk with my planetary science students in the Life in the Universe, uh, we talk about this yeah. and how really well, we will die if we leave it, yeah. and it's a host. Well, uh, I guess I would probably use that more as a, a metaphor because I guess a planet isn't literally alive. It doesn't do a lot of the things that living things do, which is like reproduce themselves. So unless an Earth suddenly gives birth to another Earth, then be awesome. it's not really. Yeah, 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 yeah it, would be, it would be pretty awesome. From the planet, be yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the planet just go. Oh, I've had enough of this. I need to have like a progeny somewhere. Uh, but. I think if we are, if you do consider us as parasite, I guess there's there's two things in that. First of all, is that people still have this kind of like value laden view of parasites as being like a bad thing. But in fact, a lot of parasites actually play very vital role in the ecosystem, and it's just like they were they're hidden from view, so we don't see it. We take them for granted, but they, they are. Price. They have like you know they're, they're pulling <laughs> strings behind the scene and. The, the reason why things are the way they are is because of these parasite pulling strings behind the scene. The other thing is that if we are to compare ourselves, the human species, as a parasite, we are not very good at it. Because when you look at the way that these parasites repurpose their hosts, they do it in a very refined kind of a way that is suitable for their own purpose. We, we're just like, we're just bumbling around, just knocking over things and wrecking things. Right. And that's what happens, uh, just bringing it back to the biology, that's what happens when a parasite sometimes get into the wrong host. So, you know, they, they in the right host, they're perfectly fine. In the wrong host, uh, they just wreck the joint, so to speak. Right. And this actually, I got a good example, which uh, brings uh, the whole uh, ecological role played by parasite and the whole bumbling parasite in the wrong host <laughs> into one. So there's a worm that lives inside the brain of white-tailed deer. Okay. So that's already enough to mo blow most people. It's like, what? White-tailed deer is a worm that lives inside the brain. It doesn't really harm the deer. It shed eggs that, you know, gets you know, passed out into the ecosystem. It infects slugs and snails and the, the, the deer gets infected when while it's browsing it accidentally eats an infected slug. And so this worm doesn't really do anything. It sits in the brain, which is quite extraordinary that it can sit there and be completely innocuous. It just tells because often the harm caused by the caused by the presence of parasite isn't so much caused by the parasite itself, but by the host reaction. So when you have an inflammatory reaction, when your body overreacts. So in this particular species of worm, it's able to calm down the immune system of the white-tailed deer. Just go calm down, guys. I'm just going to sit here. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just laying my eggs. Just don't do anything. And so this is, you know. Don't kill me. I'm just laying my eggs in your I'm just brain. Like, don't yeah, worry about right. it. Yeah, shh. Don't say it. Just it's okay. dreams now. <laughs> and so, and so, no, the, this is like a perfect harmony. It's almost like a Disney picture. Bambi jumping around with worms. Right. Spread, you know? And, but then, uh, these, uh, these particular deer sometimes find themselves in the same habitat as moose. Now, moose are big animals. They are very efficient browsers. And they usually, uh, under any other circumstance, they would outcompete the deer, except that they can also become infected by this very same worm. But when the worm gets into the moose, because it's so well adapted to the body and the immune system of the deer. When it gets into the moose, it causes all kinds of inflammatory reaction. That leads to neurodegenerative disorders in the moose, and the moose gets sick, and all kinds of stuff happen to it because the moose is trying to fight it. The worm's just going, don't fight me, you'll kill yourself in the process. <laughs> right. And so, uh, as a result... Stop hitting yourself. Stop hitting yourself. <laughs> right? <laughs> Exactly. You know, take the example of the white-tailed deer. So in the environment where white-tailed deer have the parasite, that's almost, almost like a secret weapon. Normally, the moose will outcompete the deer, but because of this worm living in it, uh, the deer actually edge out the moose because the moose is all getting sick and getting, you know, mad moose disease, so to speak, from right. having this worm in its brain. And if you don't know about parasite, you just it would just be a mystery. It's like, it doesn't make any sense. How come, like, the big 
strong news that are compete by low deer. Well, and it's weird because I, I grew up in Michigan. That's where I'm from. Mm -hmm. White-tailed deer are there's such a huge population of them. There. Yeah. And especially yeah. when you go into the northern peninsula and the upper peninsula there, that's where you are able to see moose. There's not so much in the in the lower peninsula. Yeah. But the population of those white-tailed deer, they explode. They, yeah, they yeah. make open season there for hunters all the time because there are so many of them. And I, yeah, yeah. I think that's fascinating that just because of this parasite... There's a worm, so that right. there isn't as much moose, but there's more deer. Right. Now, does, and, it, does it go through the blood... Uh, brain, you see the blood brain barrier, or is it on the outside, or how is that? Working? It it just kind of sits uh, like it's not actually in the brain itself. Okay. It just sits like in the area where the brain is. Okay, gotcha. um, so these this is one one of the example. Uh, another example is actually a parasite that I worked with uh, for my PhD. So this is a parasitic fluke that infects uh, as a part of its life cycle infects the the foot of. Uh, Cockles, New Zealand cockles. New Zealand cockles, they're technically clams, but most people call them cockles, and that's why I call them cockles. And to me, the scientific name is more important anyway, so to me, it's always Australphenus stuchberi. Uh, the little worms, they accumulate in the foot of the cockle, and when there's enough of them, they actually impair the ability of these cockles to dig themselves back into the sediment, because normally they would just sit like a centimeter underneath the sand. But when you have, you know, wave action and stuff like that, sometimes they get brought up to the surface. And when that happens, they normally stick their foot out, dig themselves back in. But if the foot becomes so heavily embedded with these parasitic organisms, they can't use that foot anymore. It will just be a floppy bag of parasites. And in fact, that's how some of them look like. And so they try to stick their foot out. They can't dig themselves back in. Uh, and it's open slather for any birds that come along. And of course, of course, that is the next host for the parasite. So it makes perfect sense for this parasite to do it, but it also has another side effect because these cockles are one of the most numerous invertebrates on the New Zealand seashore. And they dominate the biomass. And if they if they aren't infected with this worm, they would all stay underneath the stay underneath the sand. So on these mud flats, you just have soft surfaces. Whereas you have some of these worms bringing them up to the surface, now all of a sudden on these mud flats and sand flats, you have these hard surfaces for other organisms like barnacles and limpets and stuff like that to attach to. Whereas beforehand, there is no habitat for organisms like that because there's nothing for them to stick to. Now that the worm has, you know, as a side effect of it trying to complete its life cycle, bring all these cockles up onto the surface, it's created more habitat. And in fact, some of the studies that were done by my PhD supervisor before I started my PhD, he found that in areas where you have worms bringing up these cockles and laying them on the surface, have a higher level of biodiversity in certain groups of invertebrates than areas where they don't have a lot of the worms or they don't have the worms at all. That, it's, this is just completely fascinating to me. I, I don't get to think along these lines on a, on a daily basis. I'm always somewhere else. But uh, for real quick, I'm, we're going to pause for a quick station identification to let everyone sure. know who we are, what we're doing here, and why Tommy's talking about all these disgusting things. <laughs> uh, fascinating. They are extremely fascinating. Um, I was very tongue-in-cheek. Uh, we are here with Dr. Tommy Lum, and we are going into his research in parasitology. He's also an evolutionary biologist. This is the month of December here on Google+, Plus, where the program girlstart.org and the has teamed up with Google Science Fair. We have many other different partners with CERN, Scientific American, uh, CosmoQuest, the San Diego Zoo, and Every, a lot of many other places like Science Sunday, STEM Women on G+, we've all gotten together to share and celebrate the different STEM fields, getting to talk with different groups and also many fascinating individuals about their life in the STEM fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. If you want to ask any questions, feel free to ask questions on the event page here on Google+. Plus. Also on the on YouTube, or if you're on Twitter, you can use the hashtag December, and we will find them and get them over to Tommy. I believe Budini has something that she wants to ask Tommy as well, um, because of, we we love how fascinating your research is, but we also want to to hear about you. You're okay. pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So one thing that really comes across when you get talking about parasites, it's how enthusiastic you are about it. 
And yep. I think that's clear for everyone watching this broadcast. So could you tell us what made you get into it in the first place and what motivates you on a daily basis with sure. this stuff? Sure. Well, uh, I, as far as I can remember as a kid, I was always fascinated by the natural world. I was fascinated with biology and living things. And in fact, uh, I know my parents are watching, even though they're not on Google+. Plus. But I know that my mom told me that she used to be worried because I would sit in a corner and I'll be just staring at the corner. Like, I was watching ants, obviously. But she said, she'll be like, he's been there for like an hour and a half. What's he doing? There's something <laughs> wrong with him. Oh my God, what's, do we have to take him to the doctor? But I was watching ants and I just, uh, I just read everything about natural history. I was brought up on David Attenborough documentary, even beyond David Attenborough documentary, whenever there's a nature documentary. I have tapes and tapes of like, it, it, you know, the, the same place where people have like tapes of episodes of TV shows. My TV shows are all like nature documentaries. It's like <laughs> racks and racks of them. My parents keep on, you know, having to find new space for it. And so I was always fascinated. And during my undergraduate year, um, I was I've never actually told about parasites as such. They mentioned that, you know, I did a course in environmental biology at University of Technology, Sydney. And they might have they might have mentioned parasites in passing. Oh, yeah, there's these things, they're called parasites, they live in other things. Let's move on. So they never really talked about it much. But uh, when I was an undergrad at university, I was reading science magazines like New Scientist. I was also reading a lot of popular science books. And during that time, I came across a book review for this book, Parasite Rex by Carl Zimmer. And so I thought, oh, this looks kind of interesting. And during about like the end of second year, starting third year, I got my hand on this book and I read it. And it was around about the time when I knew I wanted to get into science research. I just, and I want to work on biology. I wasn't sure exactly what it is that I want to work on. And I read it and I just go, wow, this is crazy awesome. I, I, I have to get in on this. I have to. This is crazy. You know, host manipulation, how parasites evade the immune system of the host. It was absolutely astonishing. And after that, uh, because I was never taught any parasitology in uh, the year after, I decided to do an undergraduate uh, project where I would write a review article on a particular topic and I picked host manipulation. But during that time, I also like, kind of did a lot of, I guess, catching up even though I never felt like I was catching up, I, I felt like as if I just wanted to read things. I basically went out and tried to read everything I possibly can about parasitology. And it was also through reading the literature that I came across Professor Robert Pullen, whom I end up going and going to his lab and doing a PhD with. So I, I just, you know, I read about parasite, I found out, wow, they're not just disgusting, they're awesome they are the most awesome living thing and so i decided that i have to work on them and the rest is history i approached my phd as a series of research projects and during that time i was i was still completely fascinated by parasites you know you, you have your ups and downs but uh, the the ups the idea of like being able to do research was uh, enough to compensate for any down that I might have experienced during that time. And I always, I went in with the attitude of, oh my God, I might never get a chance to ever do this again. I got to do as much as I can as possible because I didn't know what was going to happen at the end of my PhD. Uh, on hindsight, I, I don't know whether I would offer this as advice or not because it seems kind of reckless. But when I went into my PhD, I didn't know what was going to happen. I just knew that I wanted to do this and I wanted to do as much of it as possible. And when I'm not doing re like actual lab bench work, I was doing research where my version of research is just going to Google Scholar and thinking, hmm, what animal I am I fascinated with? Okay, now what parasite does it have? So I did a lot of Google Scholar search, which was like, hummingbird and parasite, blah, blah, and parasite. And as a result, I accumulated all these knowledge about parasitism. And that's why I just rattle off stories like <laughs> that. They go, yeah, this thing has that parasite, and that thing has that parasite, because I was just utterly fascinated with it. You know, oh, seahorses, what parasites do they have? Let me look that up. And I was lucky enough to have a PhD supervisor who um, 
kind of was fairly lenient in that sense. Every now and again, he still taps me on the shoulder and go, hey, remember that PhD <laughs> thing you got to do. You know, <laughs> you got to get on with this, but I'm not going to stop you from like... Yeah, just we're not going to give you those letters until you actually complete it. So <laughs> exactly. exactly. But I was very grateful that he never really stopped me from like just being fascinated by parasites and everything there is about parasites. So I would think of something about parasites and go, oh, parasite behavior, let me look that up. And there are some studies that has been done on the behavior of parasites, not enough in my opinion. But um, yeah, so I just went in there and I'm constantly engrossed by everything. Like now that I know about parasite, my view of the world is very different. When let's say someone go to the seashore and they see a seagull, they see oyster catchers walking along the seashore, you know, picking up, you know, worms or cockles to eat, they just see that scene. Whereas for me, uh, or it's almost like as if you know, I thought The Matrix was an okay movie, so I'm a bit reluctant to use that as an analogy, but. It's like towards the end of the scene when you see Neo, he becomes like the one and he sees like the, the digits and stuff like that behind the matrix. It's almost the same because when I see a bird, I don't just no see a bird. There is, yeah, no there, bird. there is no bird. It's just all the things <laughs> that live on the bird. So in my, in my mind's eye, I see if these parasites are kind of like, you know, stand out and glowing. I imagine what kind of parasite a bird or you know, a seagull fly might have. and you take the seagull away and you make everything dark, you just see this constellation of glowing parasites, you know, from lice to worms to things living in its eye. And then when you see a bird, say, flying down, picking out cockle to eat, what you see is that you see hundreds of parasitic food going into, you see transmission events, you see animals nuzzling, you see, oh, well, that's when a lice or flea jump from one host to another. It gives you a very different view. Everything just seems so fascinating. Everything seems to be happening all the time. And to borrow Charles Darwin's word, there is a grandeur in this view of life. And an uh, environment that is inhabited by parasite, you can either be uh, horrified by it, or you can be absolutely engrossed and fascinated by it. And that's, you know, that's how I, I've kind of taken to it. Oh, I, I think you bring up a very, very good point that I see across many of the STEM fields is that you allowed your curiosity to, you, you let it loose and you had an environment where your parents did let you be curious and follow yes. that curiosity wherever it yep. went. And yep. I, I have found with with you know, working with students, being you know, myself and many of the people I've talked to is when you have that environment where you're allowed to have that that spark of curiosity, which right then is just I have no idea, and then you're you chase it, and you are yeah. able to go through and maybe have a little guidance here or there yeah. on what's going on. But by and large, you're allowed to be curious and embrace that curiosity and yeah. let it you you fan the flames of it naturally yeah. instead of yeah. being told no, you have to only do yeah. this or only do this. You weren't put yeah. into a box. You were allowed to yep. to find that way of finding what you love and going to yeah. school and eventually doing research and getting your yeah. PhD in something yeah. you absolutely love doing and not not many people get to do that because they oh, don't yeah. they don't have that that experience yeah. and i think yeah. it brings a lot back to just yeah. allow people to be curious mm -hmm. and, and encourage curiosity and, and sometimes and it also fall yeah. down but it's okay it, it it also brings up the issue of how education like you know, how, just how education is practiced these days, instead of, you know, getting kids to remember things, it's better to just go, hey, this is, ask questions, get them to ask questions, right. instead of having them yeah. do these standardized tests, where they just go, okay, if I, I remember these things, tests. you know, <laughs> and, and they, it's awful, because what you're turning these kids into are just like exam passing machine. Right. They don't even have to do really well. They just have to pass it. And they just have to remember a certain set of things to pass it. And then next year, it will be a different test. Well, I'll just forget everything that I remember before. And people ask me, why is it that I remember so much things about, you know, things like parasites and other things? And to me, it's because I have a structural framework that is flamed by curiosity. Every time I come across a new fact, I can fit that in into a framework alongside with other facts as well. And that really helps you remember things. You have, you know, everyone has their own different techniques, but everything kind of makes sense in a larger context of other things as well. 
No, no, definitely. I, I try to have a discussion with with my students, and as far as getting them to just share what they think about, you know, and mine you know, is, is on planetary science, but to be able to engage with them and have them think. I don't. It's not about being right or wrong, but I want you to think. I yeah. want you to make connections because once you make your own connection from one thing to the next, you walk down that path. Yep. You have have learned that it's not about well, did I memorize the the correct path mm -hmm. right now? Yeah. It's you, you're you're able to explore something that you didn't really understand before, and whether or not you're at the the true understanding of where we're at, you know, today in modern life, things are always changing, and you're allowed to see where you might have gone off, or if you were absolutely correct, and now you can go even further. I, I think it's really important to focus on being able to to explore on your own, but also open that discussion up. Yes. I think it's very important to just talk about it. Get, get curious and yeah. have a natural exploration, a natural yeah. walk throughout it. And some of the things that are brought up, uh, like for example, when I was talking about those uh, polystomatid flatworms, uh, their evolutionary history, there is nothing set in stone about how they've evolved to be what they are. There is still a lot of open question. So even if a student were to ask me, so what is the answer to this? Like no one knows. People are still trying to find out. Maybe in the future you can become a part of that. And that's and I think that's the thing to kind of the message to get across to the students and up and coming people in STEM field that like you don't just you know the textbook is history. It's what's been found in the past. You can be a part of making history in the future. Right. Absolutely. And, and speaking of, of not knowing, and I'm I'm just going to put this up here for you to read because I'm not going to try to pronounce this Latin sure. that Chad Haney did. And I love you, Chad, but. Um, it says, since Tommy Lung is not a fluke, but a fluke expert. <laughs> and then, there you go. My, my two biology oh, friends yes. can read this. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm familiar with, uh, well, I'm superficially familiar with this particular fluke or this particular worm. Uh, I'm not specifically, I don't specifically know about the biochemistry of a lot of these things, but just from my knowledge about how parasites work, how they've evolved to be, it's possible that carcinogenesis is a side effect of uh, what these parasites do in the host because a lot of parasites secrete all kinds of things to repurpose the host body for their own use. So it is perhaps um, not too surprising that you have some parasites like the one that Chad mentioned that is capable of uh, inducing you know, carcinogenesis inside the human body. Uh, I don't know the specific of what's going on. I understand that there are research team right now who are looking into this. And I like a lot of the technical aspect is beyond me, but I still read it occasionally just to know that, oh, well, you know, this is a thing. You have you know, parasitic worms that cause cancer in people for some reason. Well, it, it seems to me, at least from my limited knowledge of cancer, is it's a metabolism issue within the, the cell, and it's and if, if it's growing, it's trying to get more food. It's trying to find a way to bring more energy into it and to grow. And when you're bringing up the snails and the gonads, it's just repurposing that part to pre reproduce to get more of that in there. I, I'm sure it's completely metaphoric and not even related because I'm not even along those lines, but. Uh, it, it is really interesting on just the different side effects and how our, yeah. our personal bodies, you know, with, with mm -hmm. cancer, but cancer is not just a human thing. It's throughout yes. all of biology, yeah. or at least most of biology that I know yeah. of, that there are side effects and there are just, you know, things happen. And, yeah. you know, I... Yeah. And, and speaking of uh, parasite re-engineering the body of the host, uh, apart from animals, this also occurs in plants. So, for example, you have gall wasp that induces uh, plants to grow galls, which aren't really good for the plant. It's not good for anything for the plant, but it provides a home for gall wasp. There are nematodes that infect the roots of plants, and they do the same thing as what trichinella does to the muscle cell of mammals, except that it does it to plant cells. So you have, there are many, so many examples of parasites secreting this thing or another, altering this thing or another about the host just so that they would you know, 
they go, well, you know, this this host is fine, but it could be better. It's time to do some renovations. You know? <laughs> Love that. So we're getting a couple more questions in here. And we have a question one here, but from Liz that sounds really um, interesting. Um, mm -hmm. She's asking you, how many levels of nested parasites have you seen? Like a parasite inside a parasite inside a parasite. <sighs> And she's thinking of that song, There Was an Old Woman Who Swallowed, swallowed a Fly. Um, I, I know you exception. did a post about this recently, um, where Ed Yong wrote that article about the parasite inside a parasite. Yep. Um, yep. But how far does it go? It's, well, often when you, you know, go in one direction and then along the way you'll see other things that are also in fact, um, I think the best example I could use are aphids. So aphids, they uh, they have a gut symbiont called Bacnera, which allows mm -hmm. them to survive on their limited plant sap diet. Uh, they also facultatively, as in some aphids have it, other aphids do not, they have these little symbionts in them called Ham Hamiltonella defensa, which acti actually protects it against parasitoid wasp infection. And uh, okay. this particular bacterium, it actually got its ability to protect the aphid from uh, parasitoid wasp infection through a toxin gene that in the past it was infected by a virus, the virus injected this gene into this bacteria and somehow this bacteria now has this gene and they were able to repurpose the gene for this new purpose living inside the aphids and in turn aphids they themselves get parasitoid wasp but the parasitoid wasp themselves they also get infected by so-called hyperparasitoid wasp. So it, when you look at the different, it, it's just a matter of like how deep you're willing to look when you look for you know this so-called nested parasitism. I'm familiar with three like three orders of nestedness. There might be more as well. I have to think about that. Uh, there are, for example, the the little drawing that I made as a part of the event page which is the larval stage of a saculina uh, barnacle. Uh, this particular barnacle belongs to a group called the rhizocephalans. And it, its name, rhizocephalan, means root head. And that's because when this barnacle uh, infects a crab, the infected crab, you see the external bit, which is called, appropriately enough, an externa. That is the reproductive organ of the barnacle. The rest of the barnacle is inside the crab. And if you dissect the crab, you'll find that throughout the body of the crab, you see these roots-like tendrils. It's like if, you pull, if you're able to pull out this parasite intact, it would look like a plant because of all the roots, except wow. that it's extended to every part of the crab's body. And the, how it happens is that in the drawing that I made was actually, well, that's why I kind of call it as a series called Nightmare Begins, because it started from this little thing that is, you know, less than 0.2 of a millimeter long, settling on, say, the leg of a crab, and then it undergoes its first molt. But whereas when most barnacles settle down and undergo their first molt, they, you know, transform into a form that eventually grows into adult filter feeding barnacle. This thing turns into what's known as a kentrogen. And a kentrogen is practically a living hypodermic needle. It has a needle part called a stylet, which it injects through the thinnest part of the crab's exoskeleton. And then the parasite itself, which remember, this is a barnacle, it's a crustacean. It's just a shapeless little blob. And the, and the starlet and the chandrogen injects this blob, which is the parasite itself, into the bloodstream of the crab. And once it gets in there, it starts proliferating, it starts growing, it fills up the entire body of the crab. And when it produces the externa, it actually co-op the normal behavior of the crab. So when it starts producing, the barnacles start producing eggs and larva, the crab would actually take care of it as if it's its own brood. And at this point, you think, okay, well, what happened if this barnacle infects a male crab, which doesn't have this like maternal brooding instinct? Uh, the barnacle just go, no problem. We'll change this male crab into a female crab, wow. so that it would take care of its uh, <laughs> young. So this, so the crab is castrated, it's complete and complete mind control of the barnacle. But the thing is, is that these particular group of barnacles, they in turn have crustaceans that infect them. So there's little parasitic isopods which 
you know, isopods, most people would know them as like little slaters, little pill bugs in the back backyard, except that this isopod doesn't look anything like that. It looks more like the cherry tomato you might find in the backyard. So it settles on the external bit of the you know, rhizocephalum, whether it's a saccharina or any other, other related species, and it in turn castrates the saccharina and use it to produce its own eggs. So you have Sacralina go, aha, I got the crab. And then the <laughs> isopod comes around, go, aha, I got you. And I wrote a blog post about it in the Daily Parasite blog. And that's why I said, you know, sometimes the hustlers get hustled. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, from now on, whenever I play StarCraft, I'm going to think of you. Because you just totally envisioned the Zerg in my mind about everything that's going on. So thank you. Yep, that's, yep. that's awesome. Uh, it, I think you hit many of people's nightmares just now with Nightmare Begins, with, with hypodermic needles and yeah, yeah, yeah. the, the gonads and yeah, yeah, the yeah, yeah. mind control. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, there is so much nightmare. And that's why I'm always... Um, I tell people I don't really watch horror movies anymore about things that infect you. It's like, yeah, pff, what, whatever. That's right. so, that is so lame. So it's a worm that goes in someone's brain. So what? what else does it do? Does it puppet them as well? Does it send its tendrils out into every part of its body? Does it take over its gonad? Does it change yeah. the shape of the person? You know, Does it turn the person into looking entirely different just for the purpose of the parasite? So it's like, eh, so, so it infects it. Eh, it looks a bit gross. That's bad. It doesn't have, doesn't have the horrors associated. It's, it's very almost um, Lovecraftian in a way in that it's not the kind of horror that people associate with vampires or werewolves. It's a very yeah. existential kind of horror, the idea yeah. that something out there that could get you and you can't see it and it's, you, can't under, you can't comprehend it. You know? So that's, that, that makes that place Parasite in terms of where they sit in our imagination in a category of its own. Mm -hmm. And the challenge is out for uh, screenwriters and novel writers to come up with something <laughs> that would make me go, hmm, okay, that's, that's pretty good. So are you offering your services as a consultant for Hollywood? Sure. Any, any producers <laughs> out there? I, think I, mean, might... I mean, I need, I need funding, and I'm not <laughs> getting it from my government. So. I, I feel you there. I understand how that goes. <laughs> Actually, that was something I wanted to ask you as well. I mean, STEM education is a really important part of everyone's lives on this planet. And yeah. you constantly hear on the news, you know, funding cutbacks, recession, and so on. Can you speak a bit about the troubles you're facing with the Australian well, government? Um, uh, I know uh, that you were, you were writing about it earlier. Yeah. I mean, without going into too much detail, basically, the way that uh, funding work, especially government funding work these days, and I don't want to go into te too much detail, just so I won't like inflame anyone, <laughs> but they, they, it seems that they, they're giving out fewer grants to people who are more established. So people who are, it's basically the phenomena of the rich get richer. So you got funding, and so you have a good track record and you go, well, you got a good track record, we're going to give you funding. And then you get a better track record. And you can only accumulate so much money up to a point. And it means that people are starting out low. So for example, like myself, who only started about two and a half years ago at a faculty position, it's hard, really hard to break into it. And at the moment, the I guess for me, the existential dread is that like it, it's like as if the door is closed. I can't possibly get in. So, um, I mean, I've had people like my PhD supervisor, people who have been in the game for long ago say, look, just, just hang on, just hang on. And it's like, I have every intention of hanging on, but at the same time, I don't really see the situation. I'm not, I'm not a very optimistic kind of person. <laughs> I know I sound very energetic and bubbly and stuff, but I'm not, I'm not generally speaking an optimistic person. So I'm kind of making do with whatever I can and try to get as much research as I can from whatever limited fund I have available. Well, it, it's pretty true, and I, I know that I run into a little bit here in the, in the States as well. And it, it's it's a really hard time as far as going on, as far as money goes and research and where you go. You, you have this established way that's being done. They have all the money, but you might not necessarily have the same vision 
that that place yeah. does, but you also need to have a roof over your head and food in your belly yeah. as well. So yeah. at what point does it go? And so it just turned into a lot of a personal issue as well as yes. a scientific issue as far as you want to get this research yeah. done. But you also want to yeah. like yourself at the end of the yeah. day too. And I'm not saying and it's also, evil yeah. to do, but it's something <laughs> that you, you do have to consider. Yeah, well. it's, it's also a societal uh, issue because, you know, what does it say about a society when it just go, yeah, innovations, we don't need that. That's something that we can just, you know, it's, it's a luxury. When the society start considering something like that as a luxury, that's when, you know, okay, well, it's going to become stagnant. It's going to just, you know, die away because it's not willing to change. So, uh, yeah, it, it's kind of, you can see my it's, toes. It's, it's, a like, heavy, it's a heavy issue. It really yeah. is. And uh, yeah. we, you know, we're actually, I wanted to go a little bit longer today anyways, but that's that's definitely a subject for another time, most likely over some, some drinks with ethanol on them. Yes. Uh, yeah. that's, that's typically how those get discussed anyway. Pretty much, yeah. Um, let's see here. I We do have another question, and I apologize in advance if I slaughter your name, sure. uh, but I'm going to... I'm going to get it's Kane to pass a uh, pal maybe. I, sorry, um, you can give me how you uh, pronounce it later on. But um, what he, he's asking you, what are some of the most uh, excuse me interesting human parasites? I think te uh, Toxoplasma gondii is one of the most famous, and I've heard stories about how it affects human behavior and it would uh, increase suicide rate. Uh, there's others like tax uh, Taxoplasma gondii that changes behaviors in humans, changes directly, I mean, not indirectly, because making you cut off infested limbs, etc. I, um, I heard that it makes you more promiscuous as well, right? <laughs> Is that true? I, I'm not, like, for uh, <laughs> at the moment, I'm not really sure. I like, for me, I know there's anyway, a theory about yeah. toxoplasma and promiscuity. Yeah. 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 For me, anyway, I'm not really sure at the moment. There's a because just because the idea of a parasite that can alter people's behavior and the fact that you could possibly contract it from cats, which are the most numerous animal on the internet, uh, <laughs> that really captures people's imagination. So there's a lot of people who are, like infer all kinds of things. For me, at the moment, I'm still not like I'm still not sure how big of a deal it is. Whether it does little slight changes that you know, uh, no more than after you say had coffee or whatever, or it does some severe changes. So apart from toxoplasma, and you know, that, that, that's a thing that pops up in the headlines, where I found that every few years, oh, it's a toxoplasma gone the you know, new cycle again. So in addition <laughs> to having a life cycle alternating between a rodent and a cat, it also has a new cycle between alternating between some random facts with some new person who claims that, oh, it changed behavior in this way and that way. So there's the toxoplasma gone the life cycle, and then there's the toxoplasma gone the new cycle. <laughs> yes. But there are many other parasites that people kind of just take for granted, so to speak that do some amazingly fascinating thing inside human body. As a lot of them that I'm familiar with are worms that I guess you don't really see as much in the Western world, but a lot of them are so-called neglected tropical disease. So for example, uh, the pig roundworm, they, they undergo this migration inside the body. So when the pig roundworm, when they infect you, it'll first go to your intestine, but then it will migrate out of your intestine go through your diaphragm and into your lungs and then you cough it out during the night and you swallow back in. And there's a mystery right there. And in fact, that's one of the questions in my, you know, one of my prac class. So for students taking my class next year, there's going to be a question about <laughs> picked roundworm in there, okay? Uh, why do they do it? Like, why, why go through all this route just to end up back in the same place? You didn't so, offer them a tour to begin with, so they took their own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and there's many different theories. Some people think that because of the ancestors of these worms used to infect our uh, amphibian hosts or used to infect hosts that used to press their belly up against the ground when we still, or our ancestors were still sprawling tetrapods. And you have worms that directly penetrate through the belly skin and end up where they are. So they still kind of have this evolutionary legacy of migrating through all these circular routes. But then you have other people that says, no, they have to do this because they have to like 
build up, um, they have to collect host material to coat themselves in to evade the host immune system. But at the moment, people still don't know why is it that they go through this circular, like this, this route of going through everything. Uh, another worm that people kind of overlook because it's so commonly studied, people take for granted, but there is a very fascinating story relating to that, are uh, liver flukes. So you can get liver, so human beings can get liver fluke from eating, uh, say, watercress that are not cooked because they have little cysts that stick onto uh, watercress and other riparian uh, water, riverside vegetation. Uh, that's how sheep and cattle get infected. But the liver fluke, because it lives inside the liver, uh, most fluke lives inside the intestine. When it gets into the intestine, uh, the liver fluke comes out of the cyst and then it starts chewing its way through the intestinal wall. And then once it chews through the intestinal wall, it falls out into your body cavity and then just start crawling. And it, eventually, because of your body cavity, when you, when you think about it, it's kind of like a sphere. So no matter where it goes, it will eventually end up where the liver is. And so it just crawls along and it alternates its behavior depending on what it tastes. So along the way, it takes a little bite. Oh, this tastes like an intestine. I should be digging. This tastes like the diaphragm. I should be crawling. Oh, this tastes like the liver. I think I'll stay. So no, where's the engines? Let's 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 spice this up a little bit. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, parasites they they have uh, very sophisticated uh, both uh, sensory re receptors. And that's another thing. People think that they degenerate because they don't have eyes like we do. Sensors that we place heavy emphasis on because of the environment we live in. Uh, just because tapeworms and flukes and stuff like that don't, don't have those other sensory apparatus, it doesn't mean that they haven't in turn evolved their own sensory apparatus for navigating in their own unique environment. Because so eyeballs for example, really wouldn't help them out in the dark yeah. of inside of a body. <laughs> yeah, that's Having right. eyes really wouldn't help you, so why have them? Yeah. Yeah, so for example, my uh, predecessor here, who was a uh, uh, professor emeritus now, uh, Klaus Rode, he used to study this group of worm related to flukes called aspidogastrians. And he did some scanning electron microscopy looking at the ultrastructure and the tegument of these worms. And he found that on the head of some of these larval worms are dotted with hundreds of sensory pits. He, no one knows what they do. But this worm has all these sensory uh, nervous systems that are available to it. It, it. it uses it for some reason. And both free living stage and infected stage of parasites have different sensory receptors. So some parasites, for example, parasitic flukes, they go through a stage of their life cycle where they have to be outside in the outer environment trying to find and infect their next host. And in turn, they have photoreceptors, they have all kinds of behavioral responses to different cues, whether they're vibrations or whether they're light, in order to guide themselves towards infecting the next host. So parasites have very sophisticated sets of sensors. And when you look at the, um, for example, it was published a few years ago, was the schizosome genome, the genome for the blood flutes that infect a lot of people in Africa and Asia. And they found that a large part of the genome is actually devoted to genes responsible for the nervous system. So, in fact, they actually have very sophisticated nervous system. When you think about, say, a schizosome, it's a tiny little thing that's probably about 0.1 of a, of a millimeter long. Not only does it have to penetrate through the skin of a human, it has to get into the bloodstream, and then it somehow has to find its way through the bloodstream into the right spot of the, of the host, and also they have to find mates, they have to do these, they have to carry out a lot of the things that most animals out in the outside environment do, except that they do it inside the body of something else. So in order for them to do that, they do need some pretty sophisticated uh, gear in order to get about. Right. And it, yeah. One of the popped things... up in my IM saying to stop swearing with those big long words. It's a family <laughs> <laughs> One of the things um, the parasites I worked on on my PhD was Haemonchus contortus. Mm -hmm. And I remember one of the things they do is the larvae stay without molting if it's a drought season. They wait until the rains come and that's when they go on to the next stage and produce eggs and mate. So while they're inside the sheep, they can sense if it's a drought or not. And I always found that really fascinating. How does the parasite inside a sheep know what the weather is like outside? 
Yeah, well, another kind of example of that is that the worm that I showed earlier, there is a species that infects the bladder of a uh, spadefoot toad, which lives okay. in the desert. And this parasite actually synchronizes its life cycle with the toad. So the toad spend most of its time hibernating, and when torrential rain comes along, they all come out. They mate, they you know have offsprings, tadpoles, and stuff like that. And at the same time, that's when the parasite also produces eggs because now there's all these new hosts or these new real estates. That's when they do their thing as well. So these parasites have synchronized their life cycle with that of the toad, and somehow from inside the bladder, it's able to sense that oh something's going on. I better get ready. I gotta prepare myself for this. Yeah. And you have to wonder what are the molecular cues that tell them, okay, activate these pathways, go ahead and molt, and things like yeah. that. Yeah, there is um, actually a, I don't even know if I should bring this, bring this up. There's a project that I've been wanting to get funded for the last two years that is pretty much along this line. Um, I, okay, well, I might as well just talk about it. So in Australia, there's this little mammal called an antichinus. And it's a little marsupial shrew, and it's unique among mammals it's me. in. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So 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 it has a semel parasite life cycle. It lives like uh, its life cycle is like that of a salmon, in that it only ever mates and reproduces once in its entire life. It lives one year, and then when spring comes along, uh, the male gets really really frisky, and they do nothing but mate for two weeks. And then they just die. They get really, they they get really decrepit during that time. They start losing fur. They start getting sick. And when I look, when I found out about this thing, I thought, hmm, this is interesting because it's known that these particular mammals are affected by dozens of different species of parasites. And for the parasites, uh, when the male die, that's that's like the apocalypse for them, you know? <laughs> and it's on a schedule. They know exactly when it's gonna be. When the males right. start getting frisky, do they also go, okay, we gotta start pumping out eggs and reproducing because the world's gonna end. We gotta prepare for the next generation now. Right. Whereas in the females, because they have to bring up the young, they live past that particular period. So you know, does it mean that? Parasites adopt different strategy depending on whether they live in males or females, or in fact, are they infected with an uh, entirely different community of parasites? The specialist that lives in the male that go, okay, we synchronize our life cycle with the male. So as soon as the end comes, we're going to do a lot of reproducing. Whereas well, I the one that if, yeah. if it's a response to hormones, you know, because it it could hormones be. you know, obviously have a huge effect on us, and they could definitely, if they could be sensitive to definitely. those chemicals in there. But again, I'm not a biologist or an, well, or an evolutionary I mean, biologist. I mean, this is the question. No one right. knows at this point. That's why I'm trying to find out. That's but I'm not getting really funded for it. So. Right. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll give you some. Um, i got a couple U.S. quarters over here. I'm I'm also looking for, <laughs> for funding as well from different areas. So. Yeah. I'm with you there. But yeah. this, this is absolutely fascinating, Tommy. Yeah. Now, I, I know on top of blogging, and doing research, you also have another interesting way of inflicting your science on people, um, which I think is very appropriate with the the beginning of nightmares happening here. Would you like to share with everyone what what you also do to help relate this amazing science with everyone? I I draw I draw a lot. I, I make drawings. I do artwork. So I do a, a lot of uh, various kind of. Drawings. Uh, a lot of them are kind of fascin fantasy related, okay. uh, but some of them are also they have some kind of scientific basis. Some sometimes I just I just like drawing stuff that just um, takes the Mickey, as they say in Australia, make makes fun of a particular situation. So, for example, I drew one of um, a, a parasite of I, I think it's oh yeah, parasites of snails. And it's the one that makes them have these like glowing, well, not glowing, but pulsating eye tentacles. Right. So it's one of these tree methods. And I made a drawing of it here, which is, I'll just screen share it. And it gets the message across too. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it, <laughs> it, it, That's and, amazing. You know, it, it, that is what it does. It attracts birds to it, and then it just picks up its eye stalks, thinking that, oh, they're caterpillars, when in fact they're the larval stage of a parasite that has infected the snail. That is fantastic. 
So I, I do I do things like this. I also do like more I guess random kind of unrelated to science at all things uh, that that are like that. Uh, when I was doing my PhD, I also did illustration for the booklet. Like they have a little kind of a mini conference thing, and I did the artwork for that conference. So I also drew stuff like these, which are what I like to call carrot creatures. <laughs> so, you know, if, if someone wants to come along and go like, oh, you know, they don't have fever, they only have behavioral fever, it's a cartoon, <laughs> man. It's not supposed yes. to be real. And I also do what I call um, kind of bio biological musings. So where I take biological concepts and I think about them, but they're not things that really uh, I guess so completely scientific. It's very very speculative. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I I express them in I guess art form. So this is for example this particular one, which I got the impression is fairly popular, is when I was thinking about all these uh, parasitic crustaceans. Um, the major there's a lot of different species of parasitic crustaceans. So for example with copepods, copepods are infected uh, half of a third to half of all known species of copepods are in fact parasitic and a lot of them lives on fish, some of them infects crustaceans, some of them infect say sea squirts and sponges. Uh, the question that always kind of nagged me was that in its heyday, trilobites were kind of the you know, ecological equivalent of crustaceans. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't we come across examples of parasitic trilobites? because that niche is open to them. There were vertebrate hosts, there were other hosts that they could infect as well. But like I said, you know, parasites, they don't preserve well in the fossil record. So this is kind of my expression of that, you know, the parasitic trilobites. You, you know, you have maybe potentially trilobites that live like parasitic crustaceans do today. And the analogy for how I did this drawing is actually, uh, the living example of that is an isopod. So it's actually this thing here. So you can see these little things that are living on the oh, face awesome. of the fish. Yeah. So that that's kind of the model, and right. I guess a much better drawing of it here. Okay. And this is in the same family or the same group where the tongue biter is is found, and right. everyone everyone gets so fascinated by the tongue biter, and we're like. <laughs> Yeah. Come on! Of all things, there was like all the things that I've been telling you about stuff that you know like, infects the gonads and take over the gonads, repurpose muscle cells. Saying like, gonads gets people attention anyway. <laughs> I mean, oh, yeah. it, it will raise some eyebrows just talking about something that takes over the host gonads. Takes over, you know. Yeah. And people... I think you certainly kept your promise of um, topping Erin's <laughs> bot fly stories. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. <laughs> So we'll this is from Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we should have Erin over for a, for a rebuttal. And actually, another hangout we were it we still haven't planned a date for it, but something we were yep. talking about doing is a scientists who are also artists hangout, and that was something Chad is trying to organize with um, Michael and you, and yeah. I think that would be amazing to see. Right. Yeah. That, that would be fun as well. The drawing that I just shared previously, I thought I'll, I'll, I'll bring it up again. Uh, this is another example of when I just you know get carried away in thinking about things. I, I read a paper in Ethology about sticklebacks eating uh, lice of uh, juvenile salmon because juvenile salmon, they're not big enough to actually eat the sticklebacks. So they're perfectly safe sharing space with the sticklebacks. Uh, but these salmon, they get infected with salmon lice. And the salmon lice, their structure is that you have this crustacean-like body and then you have these long string of eggs from the females. And these sticklebacks, they actually come along and they pick off the eggs, but they're not actually cleaning the salmon, they're actually just harvesting the eggs from the salmon. So they're being real bastards, they're not really <laughs> helping out the salmon, they just come along, pick off the eggs, it might even be in the interest for them to just keep the salmon, keep Keep the lice on there. You know, I'll come back, eat more eggs as the, you know, as they uh, they produce more eggs. And that's when I thought of this particular I don't know this scenario of on some faraway alien planet of a kind of a, an agriculture where they have this very prized parasite that they harvest off an infected host, and there's a whole industry revolving around harvesting these parasites. So this is, you know, the the kind of 
this is how another venue where I think about science and think about ideas and mixing them with imagination. And I think that's another message to get across is that science is in cold and dry. Uh, things that don't aren't typically able to be done with words or yep. writing. You're able to just have an amazing way of connecting an emotion to another individual. Yeah. And it's it's not, I mean, I'm, I'm always dealing with astro dealing with astrophotography and that's a big thing of the stars art gets people inspired but it's not just to space images that are out there that are really inspired by the different sciences that are out there and I, yeah. I think it's it's a good place for us to actually wrap up because it, it's this entire December event is about inspiring and mm -hmm. celebrating these STEM fields and that there are my research as well or yep. there you know or you can be an artist there's yep. many different things that you can do but the, the primary thing that you need to do is get involved, become curious, and, and follow that curiosity. Find a great support structure along the way, too. Mm. And so if, if, if there's anything that you that is going on there, Google Plus is a great community for connecting everyone out there with interest. And now that the communities themselves have started up, you can actually find people that are in the interest of the STEM fields that are out there. So as we wrap up, this again, this is for the month of December, which is being put on by girlstart.org out of Austin, Texas, and they've teamed up with Google Science Fair as well, along with many other partners. If you want to take a look at different hangouts that have already happened, you can go to the Google Science Fair Google Plus page, the Girl Start Google Plus page, or december.org. I am Scott Lewis. I am the Cosmo Quest Education Public Outreach and Broadcast Producer. I'm the Bald Astronomer on Twitter. And Tommy, and then Bedini, if you guys want to introduce yourself, then we can sign off. Sure. Um, I'm Bedini, obviously, as my name says. Um, I, I help curate Science Sunday, and I also curate the STEM Women on Google Plus page. And We've always talked about, you know, having hangout series featuring different scientists, and we kind of kicked things off with Erin and Tommy. You were an awesome second choice to go with, and yeah, it, the series just keeps getting better and better. So I'm really excited about what we've done so far and all the things we have to come. So thank you for joining us. Thanks, thanks for inviting me. Uh, it's been great. Cool. So um, Again, thank you everyone for your fantastic comments. I'm sure Tommy would be glad to answer more of them if we had a couple more years to live, but right now we're waiting to see what happens in a week. I'm joking, people. We're and not going to die. I think um, Tommy will be answering the questions on the event page that we couldn't sure. cover on the Hangout awesome. itself because yep. there are lots of questions we didn't get around to that were really amazing. Mm -hmm. So thank you everyone for all the questions you submitted. Absolutely. So, well, yeah, I'm going to yeah. end the broadcast then. All right. Thanks again, okay. everyone. And we will see Bye. you most likely next week. Yeah, but we're not sure exactly when. But, yeah, we'll stay tuned to Full Science Sunday. <laughs> and if you haven't circled it already, you should. Shameless plugs. <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> That's what I <laughs> want. Bye. Okay, bye.